Welcome everyone to Monday Match Analysis. I'm Gil Gross. Alexi Popperin is a Masters 1000 champion. He does it in Canada. He beats Andre Rublev in the final handedly, I might add. 6264. We will discuss that and we will do our quarter by quarter preview of the upcoming Cincinnati Masters 1000 Western and Southern Open. Powered as always by BetUS. Let's start with Alexi Popperin. Whoa. First title above 250 level for Alexi on his 25th birthday. Third career title. We knew that Canada might get a little funky, might get a little awkward for the top players coming over from the Paris Olympics. We knew that. But there's no denying the difficulty of Popperin's run in terms of quality of opponents faced. And there's no denying his level of play. Certainly not against Andre Rublev. He beat five top 20 players on this run. So uh, it's absolutely tremendous to see him put it all together. He had been sneaky good all year long. And I think that's been highlighted in some high-profile matches at the majors, including, you know, having a really good chance to go up two sets to one against Novak Djokovic. But, but really, week to week, I, th- I think Popperin has shown to be at a at a higher level than he's ever been this year. And it, it it's great to see kind of a supersonic week occur to really validate all of that especially when you think about how much he struggled two years ago. He could barely win a match two years ago. So uh, I remember last year talking about Umag when he won the title over Stan Wawrinka, and it was like, okay, so, you know, he's recovered. He's here to stay. He's patched things up, and and now he's taking it to the next level. We'll get into some of the reasons why. Um, I also want to shout out his fitness. And this was a tough situation with all the rain in Montreal, almost as bad as it was for the women last year, or or maybe just as bad. Popperin had to play some long matches. He had to play twice on Sunday, quarterfinal, semifinal, and then come back for the next night and play that that Monday final. So congratulations to him. I'll also point out a third straight year Canada is won by a first-time Masters 1000 champion. I, I haven't looked through the archives to kind of dissect how how unique or how rare that is. Uh, but I do think it's worth pointing out. Pablo Carreño Busta, Yannick Sinner last year, and now Alexi Popperin. So what happened in this final against Rublev? Well, I think the rally length statistics say a lot. I think they tell you a lot about what went down here. Popperin cleaned up in the short rallies, 50 to 31 in one through four shot point lengths, 50 to 31. Now, if you want to go to the long rallies, we'll skip the medium. We'll go to the nine plus, 14 to eight Rublev. Obviously, there are less of those, but enough, a decent enough sample size where we could see that once they settled into a neutral rally, Rublev was fine. He was in position maybe to have an advantage and win this match if they settled into enough if they were able to settle into enough neutral rallies or if Rublev kept it a little bit closer in the short rallies uh I mean but I I felt that once they got to neutral Andre could exploit the weakest ground stroke on the court which is Popperin's backhand he could get it there he could find something to attack off of Popperin's backhand and, and he could burn him off of that, usually kind of burn him into the forehand uh, more often than not because Popperin would kind of get stuck in his backhand corner, maybe hit one kind of short and central, and then Rublev could attack with his forehand inside in or his forehand cross court from the middle of the court. That's what was happening in the neutral rally. So the real question when it comes to why did Popperin win the match and why did he win it easily, it's it comes down to why was Rublev losing the points or Popper and winning the points before they even got to a, a neutral baseline to baseline situation. Popper was usually winning the points before that ever occurred. Well, a couple things. One, Alexi was spectacularly deadly 
on his serve and his forehand. He outshone Rublev in that area. Andre's got a got a nice serve plus one. Very, very good. It paled in comparison to what Popperin was bringing to the table with his clutch serving, with his with his forehand being to- not only totally lethal, but also sensible. You know, he wasn't swinging for the fences off of it when Rublev hit a decent return, but it was actually the the ball control off of the plus one forehand that really stood out to me. I, d- I didn't get the sense that Popperin was, you know, really having to redline the pace necessarily, but uh, he was he was dropping dimes, essentially, or putting the ball on a dime, and I, you just felt the standard that he was requiring on the return for Rublev was an enormous standard because I saw a lot of decent, deep down the middle returns by Andre, and Popperin was still turning them into pretty damaging uh, plus one forehands. And statistically, here's how it looks like. Uh, Popperin won 19 unreturned serves, so aces and service winners. He had nine finishes, so winners and forced errors, on his third shot, his plus one. And he made three unforced errors on that third shot. So nine to three finishes to unforced error ratio on the plus one. How good is that? So Popperin ended up winning 45% of his total service points, not not just the ones he won, of all of the points where he served, 45% of them were won by Popperin in two shots or less. So his serve plus one was in charge. Rublev's was not. Popperin was destroying returns. Uh, Popperin hit six return winners in this in these two sets, and I, I know that like it's not an astronomical number. Return winners should never be an astronomical number. This is especially in men. This is men's tennis. Women's tennis, you see it a little bit more often, but when you're serving well, the return shouldn't ever really be a winner. But what happened? Too many second serve looks. Rublev only made forty four percent of his first serves. And his second serve didn't do him any favors. It started out off the match with early double faults. He double faulted five times in the two sets, but it felt like they were kind of always costly. The break points tell a lot of the story. I mean, the in the second set in the first game, uh, Rublev on the ad side hit a second serve, doesn't get to Popperin's backhand. It's right in the middle of the box. It's pretty short. It's pretty weak. Popperin hits an inside-in forehand winner return off of Rublev's second serve. At three all in the second set, Rublev tried to get it to the backhand, which was the adjustment that you have to make. I mean, when you're hitting a second serve to Popperin, you got to get it to his backhand. But Alexi was one step ahead, and he ran around, and he smoked an inside-out forehand and got a sitter forehand on the next ball that he was able to put away easily. So the breakpoint conversions were both Rublev's serve gives him gives him no chance. His serve gets demolished. Happened a lot. Uh, but it was also just a consistency thing, which might sound counterintuitive, right? You might say, how can you say that it's about consistency if you're talking about the short points? Well, because if you miss on the second shot of the rally, if you miss your plus one, that's a short point, but your consistency failed you. So one of the, the biggest misnomers when we look at rally length stats is we think that the short points are all about firepower and the long points are all about consistency. And uh, it's, a, it's a gross oversimplification because if you look at how Rublev went down in many of his service games, uh, he... Look, he played some really rough service games where he didn't force Popper to do much. And don't get me wrong, there was enough spectacular Alexi Popper in this match, and we'll talk about it. Uh, there was enough spectacular to kind of get fooled into thinking that's what decided the match. That you know Popper was was so unplayably fantastic that he almost hit Rublev off the court, or you know was just like. At, at too high a level for Andre to reach full stop. But look at the serve breaks. Look at the service breaks when Rublev lost his serve. 
and they're telling because it wasn't spectacular popperin. It was sloppy Rublev. It was much more sloppy Rublev. He started the match with two double faults and an ugly forehand on forced error. You, you can't start a match worse. You can't. Talk about, you know, talk about tone setting. Um, you know, made a couple of loose errors in, uh, in the first game of the second set uh, after being down 15-30. You know, you're in, a, you're in a tough spot here. It's 15-30. Time to lock in. Time to get serious. Made two bad mistakes. Three all, he made two bad forehand on forced errors and a double fault to go down low 40. So the big critique for Rublev is there's actually two. I'll get to the other one later. You can't have so many moments in a match where you completely gift a string of points to your opponent. And Popper never had that. But I think that was also a big part of the number that I've spent this whole time trying to explain, which is 50 to 31 in the one through four shot rally lengths. 50 to 31. I think you're looking at the double faults by Rublev. You're looking at the the plus one forehand unforced errors by Rublev. And you're not seeing any of that from Popperin. I think that goes into that number. A couple of other things that stood out to me about uh, the Aussie. He's running around his backhand extremely well. So it's... It's really not easy to get it there. I don't think he was always so so light on his feet, honestly, with his runaround footwork where uh, it's just, it's quick, it's on balance, it's very nimble, it's very precise. Uh, it, you know, it's, and it's important for a player like Popper and his forehand's way better than his backhand. So your feet need to do a lot of work in that case in your favor. And if you have clumsy runaround footwork, uh, or it's easy for your opponents to get it to your backhand, that's going to make a an enormous difference against you. So I was impressed at how quickly he was getting around, getting around the ball to hit more forehands. I was also pretty shocked at his defensive quality and his movement. Uh, I didn't realize that he had that kind of scrambling ability in him. It was uh, It was tremendous to see. And at this point... Let's talk about the other critique for Rublev because it kind of ties into the way Popperin was making Andre play extra shots and making it difficult for Rublev to finish against him. I mean, what I thought Popperin did so well is one, he likes to play deep in the court. And and uh, I've covered that before, you know, talking about especially his clay court game and his return style. He likes to play deep in the court, which means he covers the court better, but also, he just did a great job defensively. When he gets the racket on the ball, he makes the ball on the court even when he's under an immense amount of pressure. Usually, he's slicing it. So a lot of forehand slice, good defensive forehand slice, a lot of good uh, defensive backhand slice. And when you're playing Rublev, that works. Why? He doesn't come forward. So if you hit a deep defensive slice, you're staying in the point. Uh, so that that's kind of one aspect of it. But, you know, ultimately, Rublev needs to get away from the power when opponents retreat. There was way too many times in this match where Popperin was on the back fence and Rublev was hitting it hard through the baseline. You're not going to get anywhere like that. Popperin, when he wasn't made to slice... He was actually countering quite effectively with big forehands uh, from deep in the court to get back in the point, uh, because sometimes Rublev would would have like an inside would have a runaround forehand and he'd go hard inside in, not close to the sideline, and uh, and Popperin would neutralize with his forehand. Essentially, when you're when Rublev is playing someone who drops back that deep, you got to find some angle and some precision on that forehand. It's just. They are taking away your power. The power is not going to do the trick. You have to find something else. And I did not see enough precision. I did not see enough angles. I did not see enough drop shotting. I saw one, and that's it. Only one. And obviously, there's not a lot of net rushing. But notice, I'm not telling Rublev to go to the net. Uh, I, I understand that the skill isn't really there. It's not his strength. So if you're coaching Rublev, you're not saying... Well, go to the net. No. 
Like, let's figure out a way to make this work within your strengths. And I think th the way to do that would be to just change the emphasis on the forehand. Stop trying to clobber it, and let's find some angle. And let's drop the ball even actually shorter in the court. It's going to be effective if it's shorter, not blasting the ball through the baseline deep and hard. Definitely a disappointing performance from Rublev's end. Um, but overall, positive in the context of the season and, and where he's at. He's playing a lot better. And uh, it was a really smart move to, to, to rest up for, uh, during the Olympics, to take that time uh, to reset and to make the mind right. It seems like that's somewhat worked, even though, even though he came out for this final and, and you'd like him to play a big match like this a whole lot better, especially at the very start where you, know, you can send a message to someone who hadn't really been there before um, and maybe make them think a little bit and feel the pressure a little bit, and he couldn't do that. Uh, last thing I want to say about Popperin, speaking of net rushing, he came up to finish quite well. He was 8 for 11 at the net. So I want to just end big big picture thoughts on Popperin. He's kind of gone from raw to refined. He's always had a good serve. He's always had a big forehand. And he's always had athletic potential. But now he is resilient and composed as a competitor. And that's what's impressed me a lot in the last two years. And, and you look at how many battles he got in, how many wars he got in. He saved a couple of match points against Dimitrov. He's good now at finding a way to win and, you know, taking, dealing with adversity in matches. Very good. Wasn't really the case when he was younger. He makes smart shot selection decisions. He's got that cannon of a forehand, but he doesn't misuse it. He knows when to fully pull the trigger. He knows when to, you know, 80% pull the trigger or to let off completely and play a little bit safer. Everyone wants to know the long-term potential when something like this happens. Like, okay, who really is Popperin? He just won a Masters 1000. How good really is he? He's rubbing up against the top 20 now. Career high 23 in the world is where he'll stand after this one. And if you told me that Alexi Popperin spends some significant time inside the world's top 20, I buy that. He's got a heavyweight serve and a heavyweight forehand, and he can move well enough to hang from the back of the court. Does he hit his backhand well enough to hang from the back of the court with the best? That's more of a question mark. But when you serve great and you hit your forehand great and you're able to be nimble with your footwork and your clutch and you're mentally tough and you're fit, I mean, you can sustain a life in the top 20 even if you have a weaker ground stroke. And it takes a lot, right? You look at a guy like FAA or Casper Ruud, whose backhand does perform, I think, at a higher level than Popperin's. Uh, Stefano Tsitsipas, Grigor Dimitrov. Like, you got to do a ton of things at the highest level possible to make up for that. And Popperin does a lot of those things, I think, at a very high level, very good level. Not, not so elite that I think he can overcome the backhand and be a top 10 player. But I do think he can overcome it to a top 20 level, if that makes sense. It'll be interesting to see, obviously, how he carries on from this. It's going to be interesting to see how everybody carries on to Cincinnati. I think all the top players are going to perform better as a whole. Those extra few days of hitting the, the Wilson U.S. Open balls getting used to these outdoor hard court conditions. It's going to make a real difference. And everybody who came over from the Olympics is going to feel more comfortable in Cincinnati than they felt in Canada. It's going to be pretty hot. It's not going to be stiflingly hot. I don't think we're going to see like people suffering to no end, but it certainly will be a factor. And in terms of court speed, the heat plays into that. It makes it faster. And in general, we've seen over the years, quite consistently, Cincinnati is very fast. So it's a faster hard court overall. Quarter-by-quarter -quarter preview, of course. Looking forward to it. Uh, but it is a great time 
to remind you all that Monday Match Analysis is powered by BetUS Sportsbook and Casino. BetUS offers 24-7 customer service, fastest payouts in the industry, live wagering on all the biggest games and incredible variety, in this case matches, and it's super easy to get started. Currently, BetUS is offering an 125% deposit match on your first three deposits up to $2,000. Please gamble responsibly and don't harass the players. And with that, let's go to Yannick Sinner's quarter, top seed. Sinner is opposite Rublev with Fritz and Umber. My dark horse is Arthur Fies. My upset alert is Andre Rublev. My early popcorn is tough starts for seeds. I will explain. Dark Horse Feast. This is the best quarter in terms of unseeded players. There's a lot of depth here, a lot of options here. Zhang Zhizhen, Giovanni Mpechi Pericar, Brandon Nakashima, Talon Griegspor, Jordan Thompson. Whoa. I mean, a lot of guys who I might consider as Dark Horse. But I still had trouble choosing. Uh, I went with Feast because he has the highest upside against his seeds. Ultimately, I'm looking at the bottom half with Fritz and Rublev. I think that's where the most opportunity is. And if someone is going to take out those guys, you know who who has the capability in terms of uh, movement and power to uh, reach the highest level. And to me, that's Arthur Feast, who you know really found something during grass court season. And I don't, you know, I'm, I'm still getting a feel for like what conditions he prefers and which he doesn't. And it's been a little bit all over the place throughout his career. Most of his best hard court results have been indoors, but uh, I, I just, I'm going with feasts because of the upside and because a lot of the others have tough first rounds, like 50, 50 first rounds and feasts might be able to, he plays a qualifier first round, which obviously it's not easy, especially in this Masters 1000 draw size, but better than playing a seed, uh, and it gives him a chance to kind of get into the tournament with a win. Upset alert, Rublev. Pretty simple. Historically, players who go deep in Canada get killed in Cincinnati. And I know it's not quite as famous as the Sunshine Double or like Miami to Monte Carlo, which it makes sense that players have have trouble with that transition. But um, no, this one's been brutal, which, you know, maybe is somewhat surprising, but maybe it's because of the condensed kind of one week schedule. So you're going one week into one week, and that might be a little bit harder than the more spread out schedule where you have days off in that in that 12 day Masters 1000 format. Anyway, uh, let me give you kind of the the raw data here. It's actually not data. It's more history. Uh, so Sinner won Canada last year, and he lost his first match in Cincy against Dusan Lajevic, basically his only first-round loss since, like, the start of 2022, something like that. Demonor made the final against Sinner. He lost his second-round match to Monfils. You go the year before, Hercotch versus PCB. That was the final. Hercotch lost his first match against Isner. Carreño Busta lost first round against Ketsmanovic. So in the last two years, Canada finalists are one in four in Cincinnati. And I'm pretty sure that if I incorporated the semifinalists and everything there, it would would look just as bad. Uh, Not to mention, Rublev's got a tough draw. Um, Everyone has a tough draw in this quarter. It's just kind of a stacked quarter. But Rublev has the winner of uh, Zhang Zhizhen and Giovanni Pechi Pericar. And... uh, Zhang Zhizhen is a big hitter. Like he can, he'll be able to bash with Rublev. He'll go toe to toe in the power department. And Pechi Pericar is, uh, you know, he brings the serve to the table. Rublev does not like that. Rublev has struggled throughout his career against the serve bots. He's not been good against Isner. He's not been great against Kyrgios. Um, yeah, it's it it can be an issue for him. Um, what are some Bublik? I don't think he's been great against Bublik. Although we beat him at Wimbledon, uh, maybe last time they played. Anyway, um, that's why Rublev is an upset alert popcorn match. Um, so I couldn't really choose because Taylor Fritz gets Brandon Nakashima. It's an interesting one. Hugo Umber gets Jordan Thompson. That could be close. 
And then Rublev gets, as I mentioned, Pechi Pericard or Zhang. That one's interesting. None of the seeds have it easy. And to me, it makes for a lot of popcorn matches. My quarterfinal prediction is Yannick Sinner defeats Taylor Fritz. Let's put it this way. For Sinner, first of all, he is 37-1 and against players outside of the top 10 this year. The loss is, is also one of the more understandable losses you could have. He's playing Pass at Monte Carlo, coming off of the Miami title. And he was up in the third set and had to deal with that awful lines call. That's the only loss that center's had against a player outside the top 10, still. So obviously you trust his consistency. He has gone almost an entire year without losing to a player outside the top 20 on hard court uh, because Dusan Lajevic, Cincinnati last year, was the last time he lost to a player outside the top 20 on hard court. Taylor Fritz, I trust him to find a better level in Cincinnati. He struggled, you know, but he was in Paris for a long time. He went deep with Tommy Paul in uh, in the men's doubles, and he, he was struggling with the balls, did not look good against Corda at all. It was a terrible quality match because it was very windy as well. Um, should get better with extra reps, but at the same time, you do have some hesitation about, about the level that he was able to play. Going with Yannick. Let's go to Alexander Zverev's quarter, number three seed. He's got Dimitrov, Shelton, and Corda. My dark horse here is Tomas Mahach. Now, at face value, he's not in very good form, but he went all the way at the Olympics uh, in the mixed with Katarina Sinukova, and then he lost first round to Popperin in Montreal. So there's kind of no shame in that. If you go back to the last hardcourt Masters 1000 he played before that, before last week, it was a quarterfinal in Miami. And I'm, I'm looking at Miami for this tournament. I think that these are similar conditions. It's hot. It's a quick outdoor hardcourt. Uh, so I think Miami is probably the most comparable tournament conditions-wise that we've had all year. He's 14-8 and eight this year on hardcourts, including qualifying. I like his speed. And I really love his shot making off the ground. So he's been someone who I think at times this year has been capable of a pretty astronomical level. Hasn't necessarily been consistent, but uh, he's someone who I think kind of week to week is a candidate to, to make some noise in a big way. And by the way, he played well at Indian Wells too. So his his hard court season was was really good. He beat Tiafo at the Australian Open. Like when, when, when you go through it with Mahat, you realize that he's had some really good high points on hard court. Upset alert is Ben Shelton. He plays Riley Opelka in the first round, and his return is a struggle. He is 47th in break rate. Opelka, this will be his fourth tournament back. Great to see him back, by the way. He has won at least one match at every event he's played. He's only going to get better. So I think Opelka has looked as, you know, it's been as positive as you could really hope for for Opelka in this comeback. Another thing, maybe... It's going to be hard for Shelton to kick the ball over Opelka's shoulders. It is truly important for men on hard court to uh, to get benefit from the jump that he gets from his serve. If you look at Shelton's ace rates, they are not that high. He does not hit that many aces, but he he gets a lot of service winners and he forces a lot of damage with his serve in part because of how high his ball jumps off the court and it's very uncomfortable to return. But Opelka is pretty well suited to handle that uh, at his height of what, 6'10, 6'11. And by the way, that's also my popcorn match. I think that's a fascinating one. I am uh, I'm interested to see Opelka's progress. I think that he was on pace before the severe hip injury to kind of I th- I thought he was on a similar trajectory as John Isner. Who, who ended up being, for a period of time, top 10 player. So, and Shelton is also interesting because uh, the, the, the weaponry, like the tools continue to be super evident, but I, I don't think he's improving or kind of polishing the game as quickly as maybe I hoped he would. But it's important for him that he picks up maybe some momentum before he defends semifinal points at the U.S. Open. 
Quarterfinal prediction is Grigor Dimitrov defeats Alexander Zverev. I wasn't expecting much from Grigor last week in his first event since the Wimbledon injury, but he looked okay. Won his first match quite easily. He had match points against Alexi Paparin, and uh, and he couldn't finish the deal. I, I do feel like Dimitrov loses way too many matches like that, uh, but all things considered, he looked okay. Historically, Cincinnati results, a little bit all over the map because there have been struggles, but he he made the semifinal in... Uh, in 2017, and then he won it in 2018. I'm, I'm pretty sure I have those years right. Um, let me just actually check that because I, I don't want to get it wrong if I don't have to. Uh, oh, no. It was the semis in 2016. Then he won it in 2017. His only Masters 1000 title. His level has been awesome. Fourth best hard court win percentage. Only Sinner, Alcaraz, and Medvedev are better. That's this year. And if he does have to play Zverev, he was on a uh, a really big losing streak against Zverev. He snapped that losing streak in Miami. So he doesn't need to take the court with those sorts of demons and those sorts of doubts if he does have to play Zverev in a quarterfinal. He knows that he won last time. Zverev, I do have him get into the quarters. It's good serving conditions. It's hard for me to deny Zverev in really good serving conditions, but he's been dealing with some issues. He hasn't looked right. Said he was getting tired really quickly at the Olympics. Uh, He was having trouble breathing last week in his match. Seems to be missing some spark right now emotionally, and that's probably due to the physical stuff just kind of weighing him down. So uh, I'm not feeling Zverev coming into this event but I am feeling Grigor Dimitrov putting him through to the semifinals. Let's go to Daniil Medvedev's quarter. His seeds are Hubert Hurkacz, Tommy Paul, and Lorenzo Musetti. My dark horse is Flavio Caboli. My upset alert is none. My popcorn match is Musetti versus Jari. Caboli, kind of cheating, a little bit cheating, unfortunately, uh, because he... Already beat Tommy Paul today, which is extraordinarily impressive. It's It's been very, very difficult uh, to beat Tommy Paul on a hard court in the last couple of years. I have a lot of respect for that win, and obviously he made the Washington final earlier. So he takes Tommy Paul's spot, kind of, you could say, as the seed in this quarter. I like him a lot. He has my two favorite things. My, my two favorite foundational assets for a modern player— Great speed around the court and a big forehand weapon with margin. So he moves great. And if I say Kaboli hit four attacking forehands in a row, I'm confident that he's going to make all four. And I'm confident that he is going to be able to apply a lot of pressure with all four. I love the forehand. Uh, and he doesn't have any massive weaknesses that really detract from those things either. So uh, big fan of Flavio Caboli. He is my dark horse. I don't have an upset alert because Hubert Hercoc plays the winner of Ketsmanovic or a qualifier. And although Hercoc, it's been a lot of tennis coming back from meniscus surgery, uh, which is kind of worrisome. He's also been sort of upset proof. His worst loss of the season was to Popperin last week. I feel like everyone I mentioned lost to Popperin last week. Uh, that's only his second loss this season against someone outside the top 50. There was a point in Hercoc's career where you felt like he was very prone to taking bad losses, and that's gone away completely, which is great to see. Uh, Ketsmanovic or a qualifier, I'm not going to really put Hercoc on upset alert uh, given that. Uh, Medvedev gets the winner of Lahechka. This is his first event since Madrid. He hurt his back. Or Mariano Navone, who has played less than 10 professional hardcourt matches in his career. All levels, less than 10. So you could not ask for a better draw if you're Daniil Medvedev, unless Lahechka is magically like in form. And Musetti is playing Nicholas Jari, and Jari, in a wild turn of events, has not won a single match since winning in the Rome semifinal. And that's a long time. Now, at a certain point, Jari, I think, is going to, to find his level again, but, you know, all... 
all three seeds remaining, and obviously Tommy Paul already got upset, uh, all three se- seeds remaining, I, I do think that they're going to pass through safely. My popcorn here is Musetti versus Jari. This is a fascinating match. Musetti has become one of the most interesting players in tennis, without a doubt, in my eyes. Not only is his game beautiful to watch, but it's it's unique, and there's a question of you know how real is what we've seen in the last couple weeks, and especially considering his preference has been the natural surfaces. What can he do on the hard courts? Can he can he keep the good times rolling? It's going to be very interesting to see. And Nicholas Jari, as I mentioned, struggling, but still a top 20 talent. Can he find it? When will he find it? This is a really interesting match to me. You also have a good, like, attacking versus defensive. Musetti doesn't always have to be defensive, but I think he will be in this match. Um, good contrast there, which is always fun. Quarterfinal prediction. I have got Medvedev defeating Kaboli. Now, Daniil burned me last week, but I think I have to double down. He doesn't usually struggle for long on hard court. It was a funky situation coming from the Olympics, although I still consider it a pretty awful loss. Davidovich Fakina, when he's good, he's really good. And on the positive side for Medvedev, look, Wimbledon was a bright spot. So I'm willing to kind of look past the last few months, which have been a little bit underwhelming, and say, okay, he's been on the natural surfaces. There have been some weird stuff happening. I'm still going to I'm still going to back Daniil Medvedev on a hard court at the moment. There are some concerns, but not enough for me to doubt a dude who's been so good on hard court consistently the last the last four or five years. Uh, meanwhile, Hercotch is still less than a month out from his knee surgery. And he's played a lot of tennis already. So I'm rolling with my dark horse, Kaboli, in the other eighth. Carlos Alcaraz's quarter. We've got Rude, Tsitsipas, and Runa. My dark horse is Felix Auger Aliasim. Weird year for FAA, huh? His best results have been on clay. That's never happened in his career. We've never said that before. And to me, that must be a timing thing. I don't think his game has changed in any substantial way where, you know, clay courts are working better for him. I don't think that's what it's about. I just think he has found his range more recently. And then Wimbledon was kind of a tough break because he he had a knee injury in the lead up. And then he lost that first round match to Kokonakis where he totally choked. So I guess you could say that wasn't about his level. It was more about the nerve management, if you want to spin it in a positive for him. But essentially, I think in the bigger picture, his his play is kind of turned around for the better. And now that he hits conditions that that suit him even more than I think clay uh, which is you know and any court that's going to reward his serve and his forehand and Cincinnati is quick enough where it should he could get into that unbreakable mode with the first serve and the forehand firing and that that potential would be why I have him as dark horse not to mention he's got a qualifier first round and then he's got rude who is sick he withdrew last week he withdrew from the doubles in Cincinnati indicating that maybe it's still not quite right I'm sorry in the mailbag for saying that Korda beat him. Obviously, I didn't see. Uh, and and that withdrawal was like close to when I, right before I started recording. And I just, I looked at the draw and I just didn't know what happened. Um, so I'm sorry. Okay. Rude withdrew. He did not lose to Korda. Um, and yeah. FAA. Good draw spot. Better form as of late. Conditions that suit him. He's dark horse. Upset alert is Stefano Tsitsipas. You know, major adjustment for him coming. I don't think it's going to be easy. And it's a it's a strange situation. He's traveling. Let me put it this way. He's traveling with the coach that he just fired. The coach he just fired is going to be in his box. So I just don't know what the vibes are going to be like, what the communication is going to be like, what the direction is going to be. And... It's uncertainty, not to mention draw is terrible. He's got Jan Lennard Struff in the first round, 
who consistently gives him problems. And he's got Jack Draper, a lefty who's going to probably do a pretty good job of attacking, attacking the backhand. That would potentially be the second round. Terrible draw for Tsitsipas. Popcorn match. Really good one here. Runa versus Berrettini. These, these guys don't love hot, outdoor, hardcore conditions. Especially for Berrettini, I would maybe make the distinction best of three. Hasn't really treated him kindly throughout his career. And same, same goes for Runa. But Berrettini is on a 10-match win streak coming from that altitude clay double. He won Stad and Kitzbühel. Has not played since. But signs are really positive for Matteo ever since coming back from the ankle injury. And now Runa has had one tournament officially with Kenneth Carlson in charge. He's had a few weeks now to look some, look some things over and work on some things. And it's, are we going to see a different direction? You know, where is Holger Runa's game going to go from here? Because I think that there's kind of a, a blank canvas to work with. He can do so many things, and it's a matter of, uh, of, of what gets emphasized here. So Runa and Berrettini are both fascinating to me, and I'm, I'm very curious to see who comes away with that one. My quarterfinal here is Alcaraz defeats FAA. I think this is a good draw for Carlos, which is helpful because I don't know that he's going to be completely in rhythm right away with these new balls and these new conditions coming off of vacation, coming off of rest. But he gets the winner of Monfils Popperin in his first match, either a tired Popperin or a Monfils who's struggling. Uh, and then, you know, you're probably looking at Runa or Ber- or Berrettini, you know. Uh, Holger, he's played really well against last couple times. Berrettini on hard court struggles to defend that backhand. And then I think the top is pretty unpredictable. I don't trust Rude. I don't trust uh, Tsitsipas. I think it's an opportunity for Struff. I think it's an opportunity for Draper. Uh, but I think Felix is my guy right now with the first serve. I get, again, like I think if the first serve gets hot here in Cincy, he's uh, he's going to be in good shape here. I don't necessarily feel like super confident about it. Uh, and then you know Alcaraz FAA, boy, that's been ugly. That's been ugly when they've played. It was ugly at the Olympics. So Alcaraz through to the semis. Final weekend predictions: the reveal in three, two, one. Dimitrov defeats Sinner in three sets. Alcaraz defeats Medvedev in three sets. Dimitrov defeats Alcaraz in three. Let me start here. I think all the top contenders have some serious questions. Alcaraz, a let off would be natural. He's had a crazy good summer, a lot of physical and emotional events, big tournaments. Last year, when he got to Canada... He took a vacation after winning Wimbledon. When he got to Canada, he looked very undercooked. He looked completely kind of out of sorts. And I don't think it'll be as extreme this time. Obviously, Cincinnati is a place he played very well last year. But I think we will see something similar. For Alcaraz, it's going to be a build-up to the U.S. Open. I don't think he, he's going to fully hit the ground running here. Uh, Sinner doesn't look great physically. Seems to think he won't have his legs fully under him until the U.S. Open. So when we get to the end of the tournament and the matches get tougher and we get you know deeper into the week, how will Yannick hold up? I think that's a question mark. Medvedev, he just took a very out-of-character loss. And there are some reasonable questions. I know I, I rolled with him to make the semis, but you know, what is his identity right now? He's not as physical as he was. He's not serving as big as he was. So how, how is Daniil making his hay at the moment? consistently and against the very best. And it's more of a fuzzy picture at the moment. And it can't stay that way. He's got to, he's got to, you know, find something. The way Grigor has been playing, he's due for a big title, in my eyes. Almost got it in Miami, ran into a peaking center. I don't think that'll happen again this time. Plus, at the end of the event, when it gets more mental, when it's, you know, especially in the final, but it, it might help that he's won this one before. It might relax him a bit 
that he'd done it before. Mentally, that could be a little bit of an edge. So Grigor Dimitrov going a little bit off the board here for my Western and Southern Open uh, champion pick. Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you, BetUS. I'll see you next time.